Hi there, folks. Today we're going to talk about <coughs> orthogonal tensors, which are rotation tensors and rotation plus reflection. <coughs> and also look at the fact that <coughs> the um, tensor and vector algebra that we've been introducing here is consistent with the matrix algebra that you learned in undergrad. Um, under the stipulation that you restrict your attention to using orthonormal bases. <coughs> so a tensor is orthogonal if qu dot qv is equal to u dot v for all u and v in the vector space. So this here is the definition of an orthogonal tensor, and consequences of it are going to be that Q is equal to its trans... Well, that Q's inverse and transpose are the same, and, um, and that its determinant will be plus or minus 1, and we're going to show that. <coughs> so a consequence of this we see right here is that Orthogonal tensors don't alter the length of vectors. <clears throat> and to see that, we just take... Um, u equals v in the expression above. So q u dot q u <coughs> is equal to u dot u. Well, the magnitude of q u is equal to <clears throat> the square root of q u dot q u, which is equal to the square root of u dot u, and the magnitude of u <coughs> is equal to the square root u dot u. So we can see that the magnitude of q times u is the same as the magnitude of u. <clears throat> they also don't alter the angle between two vectors. at least in the sense of interior angle. So they can flip things by 180 degrees, but they can't, say, do any shearing. So, <coughs> if theta is the angle between u and v, two vectors, then we'll say cosine theta is equal to u dot v over magnitude of u, magnitude v, 
let's say that, so, so this is theta equals the angle between u and v is the notation that they <coughs> use in the textbook. So say that beta is equal to the angle between um, q, u, and q, v. So then cosine beta is equal to q, u, dot q, v, <coughs> all over magnitude q, u, magnitude q, v, or rather, that V there is looking too much like a U, so let's do that. All right, <coughs> so by the, uh, the definition of an orthogonal tensor, this part here is equal to U dot V. We showed that this is the magnitude of U, and this is the magnitude of V. So this is equal, equal to u dot v over magnitude u, magnitude v equals <coughs> cosine theta. <coughs> so that says the interior angle between two vectors is unchanged, you know, the <coughs> whatever the angle is, if you look at the one that's less than 180 degrees. <coughs> All right. So a necessary and sufficient condition that a tensor be orthogonal is that its inverse is equal to it's transpose. Necessary meaning that a tensor is orthogonal only if its inverse is equal to its transpose. So if something is a necessary condition, that doesn't necessarily mean that it has to be that. So if it was only a necessary condition, then Q inverse equaling Q transpose wouldn't be enough. But because it's a sufficient condition, that means that Q inverse equals Q transpose. And the fact that it's necessary and sufficient means that every <coughs> orthogonal tensor satisfies this. So we're going to prove this now. <coughs> so we have that the magnitude of QU is equal to the magnitude of U. <coughs> so it follows that QU is equal to zero if and only if U is equal to zero. <coughs> so 
So q u is equal to vector 0 if and only if u is equal to vector 0. Well, that means that q has to be invertible. All right, so then we also have, <clears throat> from the definition, u dot u is equal to q u dot q u. Well, we can use the definition of transpose here to say that's equal to u dot <coughs> q transpose q u. Okay, well, let's play a little bit of mathematics here and kind of add something, subtract it, and look at it two different ways. All right, so u dot u minus u dot u. Sure enough, that's always going to equal scalar zero. <coughs> well, one way of expressing u dot u is this, and another one is just u dot u, which would be u dot the identity times u. So we'll say that is equal to u dot q transpose q minus the identity acting on u. And so we'll just put, right, the, uh, the dot is always with the vector. There's no such thing as a vector dot, a tensor. But we'll put the little extra grouping square brackets there just to be sure that's what we're talking about. All right, <clears throat> and this is for all u in our vector space. Let's call q transpose q minus the identity t. <clears throat> well, if we look at t transpose, the transpose of q transpose q is also q transpose q which is to say this part's symmetric. And the transpose <coughs> of the identity is just the identity. So <coughs> So that's equal to T. So T is symmetric. We'll say t is in sim, if I could spell today. That should be an easy one to spell, right? Three letters. <coughs> All right. Well, that's cool. So let's play a little bit more mathematics where you kind of just add and subtract things and express it two different ways. So on the left side, we'll have 2 times u dot t v. <coughs> and on the right hand side, this is equal to u plus v dot t u plus v minus u dot t u 
minus v dot t v. All right, so <clears throat> this is an important little step here because what we want to show is that this is zero for any u and v, um, because that would mean that t has to be zero, which will show or explain why um, in a second. But at any rate, we see, you know, if you expanded the right-hand side out and subtracted, right, you get a u dot t u minus u dot t u u dot t v plus v dot t u, but t is symmetric, so that's where the 2 comes here. And then v dot t v minus v dot t v. So that checks out. <clears throat> but these are all of the form u dot t u on the right-hand side. And u plus v is just a vector. And we showed that, um, that u dot t u is equal to 0 for all u in the vector space. So 2u dot t v is equal to vector, or rather scalar, 0 for all u and v. <coughs> in V. So like I said, this can only be the case if T is equal to tensor 0. <coughs> Since we could examine u is equal to e1, e2, uh, for each, v is equal to e1, e2, en. <coughs> right? So, if um, even if the basis is not orthonormal, if a vector dot every other vector in that basis is zero, right? So like Uh, u is equal to 0 if and only if u dot fi is equal to 0 for all i. <coughs> so it doesn't even need to be orthonormal. Um, but if it's not orthonormal, this wouldn't, you know, u dot fi wouldn't give you the ith component. Um, but it would still, you know, one of them would have to be non-zero. So, if it's that way for each, right, so if we say v is equal to e1, well, u dot tv is equal to zero. All right, it maps one for each of these ones, you know, e1, e2, for our u. So then we know that it maps e1 to zero, you repeat the process for E2, etc., all the way to En. <clears throat> so sure enough, T maps every vector to 0. And so that only happens if T is equal to the 0 tensor. So that means... Q 
transpose Q is equal to the identity. <clears throat> well, by the definition of the inverse, definition of the inverse, that uh, that means Q inverse is equal to Q transpose. <clears throat> Well, from our talk on the determinant, <coughs> we know that the determinant of the transpose is equal to the determinant of the original tensor. <clears throat> yeah, we'll give that a little then. So the determinant Q transpose Q is equal to the determinant Q Q is equal to the square of the determinant. <coughs> well, Q transpose Q is equal to I or the identity tensor, right? So this is equal to the determinant of the identity tensor, which, how'd that happen? I didn't like that. Computers, man. All right, so that whole thing is equal to one. <clears throat> so the determinant of q, well, that thing squared is equal to 1. And so we have that the determinant of q is equal to plus or minus 1. So if it's 1, q is a rotation. which means that it keeps the handedness of any basis, right? It keeps the orientation of your space. <coughs> if it's negative 1, Q is a reflection. So one of the directions gets reversed. <coughs> um, Possibly in addition to a rotation. <coughs> well, the important thing is if the determinant of Q is equal to negative 1, you know, it can rotate it around, however, but it's also kind of flipping your space inside out. <coughs> Orthogonal tensors form a group under multiplication in the sense that if you multiply <coughs> two orthogonal tensors together, you get another orthogonal tensor. If we restrict our attention to only that subset of the orthogonal group satisfying the determinant is equal to plus one, so we're getting rid of the things that have ro 
reflections. Uh, that group is called the proper orthogonal group, which is the space of finite rotations. An interesting thing <clears throat> about the proper orthogonal group, and in fact the regular orthogonal group as well, is that it's not a vector space. So it's a group. You can multiply them together, but it's not a vector subspace of Lin V. If you add together two orthogonal tensors, you do not get another orthogonal tensor. So in fact, the the proper orthogonal group um, can be identified with the real projective space in three dimensions, or uh, the three-sphere if you identify antipodal points of it. Um, and it's caused <coughs> people all sorts of issues because you can't add things together. So if you want to, say, interpolate between two orientations or multiple orientations smoothly, it uh, becomes pretty difficult to do in high order fashion. It's why we have things like quaternions. And if you look into the, the math of finite rotations and their calculus, you'll find it quite interesting. or at least maybe more rich than you would have expected for something that <coughs> you kind of encounter in undergraduate linear algebra, but it kind of gets glossed over because it's such a, a nasty entity. All right, <clears throat> let's run through exercise three from section 212 in the textbook. <clears throat> so we're going to let Q be a rotation, which is to say one that has the determinant of plus one, not negative one. and show that for any pair of vectors u and v, <clears throat> we have that q u cross v is equal to <coughs> q u cross q 
QV. Implying that Q <coughs> is equal to its own cofactor. All right, well, we've established that all orthogonal tensors are invertible and that, in fact, their inverse is equal to their transpose. <clears throat> that was ugly. So its cofactor tensor is going to be the determinant of Q times Q inverse transpose. <coughs> Well, Q inverse transpose is the inverse of Q transpose, which is just equal to Q. <clears throat> so Q's cofactor is equal to Q's determinant times Q. And determinant of Q is equal to plus 1 for a rotation. And by definition, the cofactor satisfies. <coughs> cofactor acting on the vector that is the outcome of u cross v is equal to qu cross qv. <coughs> we said that q's cofactor is equal to q, so q u cross v is equal to QU cross QV, like that. <coughs> so that's pretty cool. All right, that's about it for the orthogonal tensors. Now we'll go real quick on to the matrix of a tensor, which is a brief section in the textbook. Um, so we're not going to use matrix arithmetic much because it turns out not to be as useful as index notation and the summation convention or as direct notation where you don't use components, um, particularly when you start getting higher order structures like third order tensors and fourth order tensors but um <clears throat> it would at least be good to show how what we're doing fits in with what you already know and show you that it's consistent with it all right so if we pick a fixed orthonormal basis 
and like super extra stress on the orthonormal there, <clears throat> as well as on the fixed, really. Um, then all of the index notation, summation convention algebra we've done with vectors and tensors is consistent with what you already know, as long as you pick row ordering for the components of the tensors. Right, so the row would be the first index and the column would be the second index. And the tensors would be with respect to the basis EI tensor EJ for tensors. Right, so row column <clears throat> and you make column vectors out of the components of vectors with respect to EI. I guess we'll give these little set notation. <clears throat> so for a fixed basis, and it's assumed that you have a fixed orthonormal basis anytime you're doing this, the matrix representations of vectors and tensors are So we'll denote it by putting square uh, brackets around whatever the item in question is. So square brackets around a vector gives us a column vector of its components. And square brackets around a tensor gives us its components. row ordered. <clears throat> right. And so 
you know, if we wanted to say, let's say we had another vector u, and its, uh, its matrix representation is u1, u2, u3. Well, <coughs> you know, these vectors and tensors here are simply what they are. Um, so if we decided to do all of this with respect to another fixed basis, even if it was another fixed orthonormal basis, all of these scalar components would change, even though the underlying vectors are still the same thing. Um, <clears throat> and while you can always pick an orthonormal basis you know, to do this, there's not necessarily always a canonical way to choose which orthonormal basis. So like, let's say you're sitting in your room. Um, there's not necessarily a canonical x, y, and z direction. You know, it's just a three-dimensional space. Um, so if you made the vector between you and something nearby, the components of it would be one thing if you picked one set of x, y, and z. <clears throat> but it would be another if you picked a different set of orthonormal bases. So, um, you know, that's why we're trying to draw the distinction between vectors and the, like, column vectors of their components, or tensors, and the matrices of their components, is that one, you know, the, the actual vector or tensor is a thing that simply is, um, whereas the matrix representations of the components depend entirely on the way that you choose to describe the underlying space in terms of a basis. All right, so let's see what is, oops, say V is equal to S times U. Right, so as long as everything's <clears throat> in respect to this fixed orthonormal basis, then we have V1, V2, V3 is equal to S11. u1, u2, u3, like that. <clears throat> and so we can multiply that out using your familiar matrix algebra. And if you carry through all of the math and used your index notation with i going from 1 to 3 and j going from 1 to 3, you'd find this is the same result. vi is equal to sij uj. But holy crap, does it take longer to write the, the matrix representation. Um, another thing... <clears throat> 
you know, when we have it this way, you leave the free index, uh, <coughs> then, you know, it's implied that that's times EI. Um, so this would be, you know, th there, there's a way to work your basis vectors back into it. Whereas you really can't work the basis vectors back into this matrix representation of a tensor without just going back to uh, back to this. So that's um, you know another case to be made for using the index notation with the summation convention is if you wanted to look at it and include your basis vectors, for instance, if you wanted to have basis vectors transforming or something. Uh, there, there is a way to <clears throat> do that, whereas you're kind of stuck with the matrix notation. Um, so, of course, you know, as long as we have our fixed orthonormal basis, then we have that the uh, we have you know that the tensors transpose, inverse, determinant, trace, etc., are related to the matrices in that the matrix of S transposes components is equal to the matrix transpose of S's components. Um, if it exists, the matrix of S inverses components is equal to the matrix inverse of S's components. And again, these are all only if it's a fixed orthonormal basis. Um, <clears throat> the determinant of S is equal to the matrix determinant. These would definitely not be the case if you didn't pick an orthonormal basis. The trace of S is equal to the trace of its matrix representation. <coughs> so it's, it's nice that, you know, this stuff fits within the way that you already know how to do it. But the index notation and summation convention um, is like easier, less error prone, and it'll take you further um, because the usefulness of matrix notation takes a real nosedive if you encounter anything higher than second order. So like tensors higher than second order, you know, things that have <clears throat> more than two basis elements. So like it's pretty useful, rather useless. Right, so the alternating symbol times uh, the component of a vector. Well, geez, you really can't do anything for that with matrix notation. Uh, you kind of need to use index notation, and it gets even worse for fourth order tensors like your, um, you know, constitutive relation that relates stress to strain. So, you know, that's why, among many reasons, we're kind of staying away from using matrices um, or using this kind of more graduate level way of doing it and showing that it's, it's consistent with the way you already know how to do things, but it's more powerful and less error prone, which is why we want to get you in the habit of using it whenever you, know, you can. So it's always useful to go back and know that <clears throat> you, know, you can pick E, X, E, Y, and E, Z, the orthonormal basis, 
But then go pick another basis that is not orthonormal, and you can show that all of our other stuff worked. And then you can pick a different orthonormal basis that's rotated from it, and do all this math, and always, you know, at the end, if you want to check, you can convert it back to EX, EY, and EZ, and you find that it worked. Um, well, unless you made an error, but it's a good way of checking to see whether you made an error. All right, that's it for now. We'll uh, wrap up algebra in the next lecture. I was looking at how much content there is on spectral, spectral stuff, you know, like eigenvectors, eigenvalues, um, and the Cayley Hamilton bit. So I may break it into two kind of medium lectures instead of one long one. We'll see. That'll be within the next day or two. So you'll have, you know, a solid week of having all the lectures in your possession to complete the homework. Um, have a good one.